so yeah, I'm Dan Lear uh, from the Duke Center for Genomic and Computational Biology. And today I'm going to be talking about a software collaboration uh, with a researcher called IMAT. And I want to start a little bit um, mostly focusing on how we develop these uh, software collaborations and what, uh, what we do to get out of them. And so why, we, why we're doing this in the first place, uh, we develop scientific software to promote uh, dissemination, exploration, and then ultimately the impact of a particular method or data set. And so we have these really uh, novel, cool uh, data sets and uh, methods and applications that get built, uh, but unfortunately due to uh, you know, low availability of software engineering practices, um, uh, resources, tools, database engineering, things like that, we, we start with something that's very cool and shiny in the beginning, but so many research projects lead to a state of disrepair and it just kind of, you know, weather happens and, and we get into things that, that we can't really uh, take very good care of. Uh, so my group in GCB, the informatics team, uh, one of our uh, core goals is to focus on providing these professional data management, uh, reproducibility, computational uh, reproducibility, software engineering, and know-how, and make those accessible to the researchers in our group. Uh, and so one such collaboration that we really uh, worked on here was called IMADS. And so this is a figure from their recent publication, uh, just came out, was published in April. And the idea behind IMADS is that uh, the lab and researchers experimentally uh, build these uh, microarrays and they scan them and figure out where, uh, what transcription factors, what proteins bind to DNA and where. And so they, they build this big training data set, and they scan that in, capture it, uh, and then in the second uh, phase, the, the modeling aspect, they, they build a, a model that can predict how other transcription factors will behave and how one transcription factor, one protein, will prefer another uh, on the DNA strand. And then the, the third phase of that is the, the database application that we built and make that, that data and that method available. Uh, and so you can find more information on the uh, the, the publication, the methods, and everything at the, the DOI below, and I'll have a link for that. Um, but when I want to talk about how the, the collaboration got started, and so the, the PI on this project uh, is a researcher in GCB uh, named Raluca Gordon, and she came to us with a, uh, some very, uh, some grand vision ideas on, on what she wanted this, this project to look like. Uh, and so obviously she, as the researcher, brought the, the methods and the data sets and some basic Python code that, that generated some of the, uh, the experimental data. And we, in the informatics team, you know, we're focused more on engineering practices and tools and being able to support those things. And so we, we kind of had these, these conversations at the beginning of you know, wanting to square this idea of this is the big vision that you want and this is kind of what we're thinking we're comfortable with right now. Uh, and so to, to pull that, that metaphor a little bit further, uh, I want to illustrate something that it's a philosophy that comes from uh, very popular in startups or technology uh, cultures where you're talking about building a, a minimal viable product. And the idea there is that you want to e either fail quickly or you know, determine what the audience is and, and what the needs are before you spend, say, five years developing a product that, that nobody really asked for. Uh, and so the way we apply that to scientific collaborations is uh, what I'm going to uh, talk about for the rest of the, the, the session here. Um, but the idea is that, you know, we're, we're getting our feet wet as informatics uh, collaborators. We're not experts on the science, and they're, you know, getting their feet wet on how to collaborate with us, provide what we need, and hopefully we can work together to you know, build something in phases. And the other aspect here um, is that, you know, let's say we had set out to build a car in, in five phases or five years and ran out of time or ran out of funding. Uh, well, if we'd gone with the you know, the top line, we, we might have something without a steering wheel. But if we, you know, take the lower approach where we're building shorter term milestones and deliverables, we have, you know, maybe a bike, a skateboard, or a scooter, even if we have to get to a point where we have to, you know, put pencils down, so to speak. Uh, so the first milestone, the first circle we drew on what we wanted to do uh, was to generate whole genome predictions. So to take the experimental uh, methods and apply those to the, the reference genome and build uh, predictions, browser tracks for the genome browser, 
to cover the entire genome for something like 11 different uh, transcription factors. And the, you know, the, the path to get there, we started, you know, we started at base kind of, let's see what the code does now um, and bring our engineering practices. So we uh, looked at, you know, what, what is this doing? What kind of test can we write to prove that, that it works and that it does what, what we're trying to make it do faster? Uh, and, you know, that, that test uh, practice was really a, a great starting point for bridging this collaboration gap where we could both, both parties, both the informatics uh, folks like myself and the experimental folks in the lab could agree on, oh, yes, this is what this uh, piece of code is supposed to be doing. We found some bugs. We fixed some things. We made it uh, faster and better. We uh, heard somebody ask yesterday about, you know, anybody written their own faster parser? Well, this had its own faster parser. So we, you know, use BioPython for that instead, um, you know, build up kind of our portfolio of, of technologies and libraries that we can bring to future collaborations and, you know, really make a, a, a high-performance command line tool that can be used as the core for the rest of this. And the audience here, you know, again, focusing on the audience, you know, we're, we're building a skateboard for people who can use a skateboard. Uh, we're really looking, focusing towards the, uh, the, the lab themselves and the people that, that need to generate these predictions for their own uh, papers and data sets. Okay. Uh, so once we had that core command line tool, uh, you know, kind of working more efficiently and robustly, we could scale that up to run in parallel, um, split apart the, the reference genome, uh, run it on all the different models, and you know, come up with something like 2,000 parallel tasks to be able to generate this data set, which isn't very big, but um, we found that there were constantly new iterations of the models, there were different changes to some of the approaches, and we had this whole data processing pipeline after the data generation, and we were rebuilding the data set and wanted to make sure we did that reproducibly, uh, so we brought in uh, CWL to write a, a pipeline here. Uh, some of those boxes are a little bit small, but basically we just, uh, it's just some data transformation and a, a make file that makes a, a UCSC genome browser track hub, and so that can be linked with the genome browser, that can be uh, brought into Ensemble, you can get the big bed uh, data set yourself, and you know, pull the, the numbers out, search for things. And so this is entirely reproducible, you know, from, from start to finish. We, we start with reference genomes and out comes a track hub. And then if we uh, change the, the model files, we can, you know, type make and have it come up again. And it was really valuable for uh, reproducibility and maintainability uh, because if we had to put this on the shelf and work on a different project for a while, uh, you know, we could come back and really see illustratively what, what this was supposed to do. So the browser tracks uh, that, that are generated look something like this. So this is just a screenshot of the genome browser and all these uh, gray boxes are the, the predictions. And so we had some back and forth with the, uh, the researcher on, you know, what's the best presentation for this? Uh, you know, should we do lines or blocks or intensity? Uh, and we found something that, that we thought worked well and, and fit the model and, and learned a lot about the, the data formats as well. Uh, so at this point, we've got a kind of a bicycle level data set. So we've got something that's generally available and generally usable, but doesn't answer a lot of specific questions unless you can go get the code and, and check out the command line tool and run that. Uh, so, you know, moving forward, we, we felt that we had enough uh, confidence and, and uh, common ground on the project here to build out of those next steps, sort of, you know, bolt on uh, a motor, if you will. And so we're ready to talk about the, uh, this big online database that houses all the scores, uh, does some visualization, and can even take data sets in from, from the audience and uh, generate predictions on those. So the first phase here was to uh, build out that database. And the use cases we were targeting here, again, uh, so you know, widening from you know, the skateboard and the bicycle, and now we're, look we're looking to address the, the domain scientists that are looking for integrated queries, so maybe it won't answer every question they have, but a lot of the common ones. And so the, the people that are looking for information about these transcription factors might want to cross-reference with a gene list, or they might have their own regions of interest on the, on the genome after an assembly or something to, uh, to look for something. And so we settled on kind of an API-focused uh, service with uh, the ability to generate SVG, uh, and CSV data sets so people could, you know, have some portability and interoperability with other tools, 
Uh, and at this point, the, the collaboration really became very, very iterative, lots of regular meetings about you know, what, um, what we would suggest for a user interface component or what might uh, make sense or other um, tools and resources that are online and available that might do similar things that would be you know, kind of a common ground for, for the audience of these tools. Uh, but as the project grew and as the, uh, uh, as the database application grew in features and scope, you know, there's uh, necessarily more engineering and more risk uh, that goes along with there. So to build that um, you know, kind of motorcycle version, we had to really do quite a bit of database tuning. So we, um, you know, foolishly when I looked at this uh, problem, I thought, well, why can't we just throw this all in a Postgres database? And it you know, had to be explained why you know, uh, sequence data doesn't really work in a relational database unless you do quite a bit of tuning. Um, but we looked and you know, our, our data size here, we had about uh, 314 million scores of predictions and pulled in about 500,000 gene lists or genes from gene lists. I found that there was you know, 600 million or so uh, overlaps. And, and the goal is to be able to search for you know, these, these joins between the two orange circles, so what genes and what uh, predictions overlap, but also have some kind of a margin or a range on either side. And that's where this, um, these gist indexes, these kind of geometric queries that, that Postgres uh, brought in a few versions ago were really valuable um, because they're, I think they're in there and the operators are for uh, geospatial data, so being able to see if something is within a region or within a range, but they work very well for two dimensional or one dimensional ranges as well. And so that, uh, that engineering, that database uh, attention is really what got the, you know, this turned into be a 350 gigabyte Postgres database, uh, something that we can put on the web and have, you know, click page through it and search and type and have it immediately update. And so that was really, um, really interesting and fun engineering challenge. Uh, and so the, the website as it looks right now is uh, up here on the screen. And the question being asked here is, is, some, is you know, kind of one of our typical use cases is, show me the genes where the, the binding uh, for CMYK is the highest. And so it's uh, sorted by the, the max binding score in that second from last column. And we print out the, uh, the genomic range, what strand it's on, uh, what genes and what their identifiers are. And everything on the left-hand side, you can, you can switch out and get a new query. So you can look at a different assembly. You can pick a different protein you might be interested in. You can choose another uh, list of genes for that assembly, or you can upload your own uh, range. And so once we had that you know, high performance database able to search and really expand that audience to people that were comfortable with a web interface, there was still one more uh, desired feature and that's for, uh, for folks to be able to upload their own FASTA sequences or put their own data in and get uh, IMADS models predicting on their data. And so this is a little bit um, uh, interesting because we could kind of you know, put a capstone on everything we've done and take the, the CWL pipeline that we wrote to generate the predictions, generate the tracks, and containerize that up and put it on the web server. So we're running the ex exact same prediction code, the exact same pipeline on your data as the uh, uh, reference data sets. And so this was something that um, you know, ended up being very, very powerful and you know, very instructive as to how to build these and how to you know, have something that's more than just a, a database and a, a front-end web application. And uh, in practice, it looks a little bit uh, something like this. And we've got some sample data sets that you can click around uh, and see what, you know, what this looks like. So you get the same prediction scores, but you get it on your own data. It takes 10 or 15 seconds because it's spinning up a Docker container to run the analysis and then uploading the data sets back. And you can share a link to it. You don't have to log in. It's um, all very easy and designed to be um, self-contained. Uh, so we got to the point where we were building a, uh, you know, figuring out how to build a car and now we wanted to document how we could build a factory to build a car because when we're building uh, products that need to, you know, survive or be maintainable, we want to make sure that we have some, some portability, some um, uh, organizational uh, uh, infrastructure and knowledge. And so from the get-go, everything, everything I've talked about has been open source, so the prediction engines, the model training. Um, the pipelines that generate the tracks, the web applications, but you know, finally we use uh, Docker and Ansible to orchestrate this. And we started you know, building out on Ubuntu virtual machine and working with university IT to do patching. They wanted Red Hat. 
And so since we had these Ansible playbooks and Docker descriptions, we were able to just you know, change one server name and a command and, and run it and have it entirely deployed from, again, from zero uh, all the way up to the 350 gig database and the four different Docker containers up and running. Uh, so just to wrap up, you know, these, uh, these things were very important to this collaboration. We've been very lucky to be able to focus on uh, building these uh, research products with support from the institution. Uh, very highly collaborative, and that was not something we could have uh, accomplished without that collaboration. Uh, but always keeping in mind the, the target and the audience has been very um, key to those successes. And we try to bring the reproducibility that we bring to computational um, uh, experimentation and scientific method, we try to bring that to the deployment and orchestration as well. Uh, but I think the, the best outcome of this project was uh, relationships we're building and the other collaborations that we're hopefully inviting uh, within the center. Uh, so briefly to acknowledge some folks that are, that are here on the informatics team, uh, John and Hilmar, and from Reluca's lab, uh, Reluca, Ning Shen, and uh, Josh Shipper. Uh, these slides will be up, and uh, the link for IMADS on GitHub and on the web is uh, here on the slide. So thank you.